Hola, bienvenidos a todos. Tenemos dos grandes masterclasses esta tarde. Eh, una de ellas es con la querida violinista Sabine Bretschneider Johumsen, que nos acompaña desde Dinamarca y que está con nosotros esta tarde. Y además tenemos a la querida chelista Katri Ervama, que originalmente es de Finlandia y hoy nos acompaña desde eh, Estados Unidos. Entonces, muchas gracias al público en general por estar con nosotros y damos bienvenidas y por partidas estas dos clases magistrales. Muchas gracias. All right. Hello and welcome. Today um, I am in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I am so delighted to be here today and happy to report that um, that um, Joseph Biden was just sworn in as the president of the United States, which is an important occasion. Um, and likewise, I am so happy to hear um, two wonderful musicians today. And uh, so I'm not sure who is going to play first. Um, I think we should, I think we should hear the performances and then we can go from there. Is that, um, does that work for everybody? I guess I can say a few things about myself and, um, and I think that that'll help you understand also the things that I may talk about later today, which is that I am completely classic. I studied in Finland and then I studied chamber music in England at the Britain Pierce School and then here in the United States at the with the Vermeer Quartet at Northern Illinois University and here and then at the University of Michigan where I now teach. And when I came here to the doctoral program with Alejandra, I also um, got into improvisation and I think that the best of both worlds, merging the classical music and the improvisation worlds has really informed my choices um, in performing since then. And I think that that will play a really big part in what we will hear the, um, I believe the Quran from the second suite by Johann Sebastian Bach. And also uh, in the improvisatory characters that we hear in the last moment of the Elgar Concerto. Um, and so I really look forward to hearing these pieces today and perhaps talking about how improvisation could have played a part in, um, in the composition process at least. And maybe it should also inform our performance. Hello, Camila. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so you will, um, are you playing the Quran from the yes. second suite? Yes. Perfect. Would you like to just, um, would you like to tell me just a little bit about yourself and then just play for, to start with? Uh, I'm from Brazil. I study in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, Professor Hugo Pilger in the university. And I play uh, for eight years, I think, now. And I'm studying the second suite. <laughs> Very nice. So you, you play, you've, you're studying the whole suite? Yes. Perfect. And now you're playing the Quran. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. 
so much. Um, so, um, am I correct in that you're playing from the Baron Writer music? Yes. Yes, I have the very same bowings as you do, so I, I assume that this would, this was the case. Um, and uh, so let me just ask you just a couple of questions about why you make it made those musical choices that you've made. But let me just um, I don't know for the audience I need to talk a little bit about Bach in general, right? Um, so the six Bach suites are kind of a lifelong journey of a cellist. And Camilla, probably you, you agree with this, right? So we, we start playing the suites kind of at a young age, and then we study and restudy them all the way through our development as a cellist. And for myself, uh, I studied this D minor suite many, many, many years ago, and it's I still keep finding new things about it because it's one of those things where every time you come to it, you find new things and you find new solutions. And um, there, the interesting thing is that every cellist has their own personal way of playing Bach. There is no one solution what is right or wrong. Yes. Um, and we don't have a manuscript in Bach's own handwriting. So the best we can do is we can um, we can look at the different sources. The earliest one is by Bach's wife, Anna Magdalena Bach, right? But there are very curious differences in, in the bowings and even sometimes different notes between the editions, right? We have some sources. And so you've already made the really informed decision to play from a very good edition that has scholarship behind it and so uh, there are probably a thousand different editions of Bach right and everyone has slightly different bowings and fingerings and even sometimes different notes but the Baron Rider scores are really going back to the source to Anna Magdalena and the other ones the Kellner source and other ones and making really good choices about bowings and good choices about the notes and uh, based on on scholarship and so i commend you for that and i'm not even going to talk about articulations or bowings or anything like that and here's my reasoning uh, bach was an improviser and as classical musicians you know we look at different music and we think well we must know what bowing we do here and we must always do it the same way and we must always do the same fingering, right? And we must, we, we ponder these sort of musical choices and we think about, oh, this is, this is how we play this piece, right? And we always play, strive to play it the same way. But I think that an improviser's brain is different. And the idea that everything would always be the same is kind of absurd even to an improviser because the music is meant to be different. Now, it doesn't mean that they study the piece any less, but they study different things about the piece. And so the thing that I want to talk with you about is the harmony and how the harmony can, can inform your musical choices. How does that sound to you, Camila? Yes. yes. Good? It's okay? So have you done have you done a bit of harmonic analysis with this piece? A little bit. A little. What's complex about it? Uh, I think uh, because it it doesn't have many uh, chords. Right. And the the line is. Uh, the harmony is always linear. It's not yeah. vertical at all, right? Except when we have double stops or triple stops, for sure. Yes. So I don't know uh, if I'm right about the what I think it is the the harmony. Yes. Um, you know what's interesting, and I did not realize this really fully until I started improvising myself, is that actually. Each, each scale has a harmony that goes with it. And so if you figure out what scale you're playing at any given moment, 
then you know what the harmony is too. Mm -hmm. I think that the second suite is difficult from a harmonic perspective because it's in the minor key, right? And mm -hmm. so we have three different minors that we always choose from, right? And composers switch between the three minors at any given moment. So we don't know if Bach is using the natural minor or the harmonic minor or the melodic minor. And so when we modulate, it gets even trickier, right? When we go to another key. Mm -hmm. And so what could be a hint for you that we're modulating? What are those? There's like a couple of red flags, right? Uh, the the change of uh, accidents that's right accidentals yes exactly right so when you start when you start seeing sharps or maybe flats or naturals you know that we are possibly moving to a different key right but here's the thing in minor it doesn't necessarily mean that we're moving to another key it just means that we're using a different minor mode so if we're, using, if we're in D minor, for example, and this is kind of long-winded theory right now, but I promise you it's going to have a musical, musical idea in just a second, right? So if you're using a harmonic D minor, how is that different from the natural D minor? Uh, the C? Yes, right, C sharp. So when do you see your very first C-sharp? Uh, the second bar. In the second bar, right? And can you play that chord that where we arrive in the second measure? Yes, and we have the A on the top too, right? Yes. We want to hear that, right? Good. Um, I, I play that open A just because I like the open sound of it. So, um, does that, what chord is that? Do you know? What chord is there? What chord is this? Uh -huh. It's pretty it's, uh... tricky, actually. What are the notes in it? A, 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 uh, A seven chord. Yes, that's what it's called. It's called a dominant seven chord. And so dominant because A is the dominant of the D. Yes. And harmonic because we have to, we make it a major chord, right? So a major triad with a minor seven. Now, why is this important? It's not a particularly dissonant chord. It's actually kind of a nice chord. Right? But the way Bach has chosen to configure it, to voice it, we have this whole step here. It has a really nice dissonance, right? Can you hear? I'm not sure if this comes across in the sound, but there's a beautiful openness and a dissonance to it. And then a further dissonance with that tritone, right? So we have a whole step. Right? So what I would encourage you perhaps to do here because of this, this um, dissonant voicing is to maybe lean on this note a little bit more. So that when you start the piece, you know, we're in D minor, right? And then we go, when you go here, it's very dramatic because it's so dissonant, right? So can we try it with that idea in mind that we have just a simple old D minor chord to start with, with some triadic motion and with some uh, lines, and then we go really lean on to that dissonance and see how that, See how that feels to you. And then you can keep on going um, until the next cadence. And that's a trick question because I the question is where is the next cadence? Like where does it end the next time, right? <laughs> And 
And how is... <laughs> well, I mean, it kind of arrives here, right? Right? But, but because it's not the... Fund, it's not the root of that chord. You know, we're still in the A7, right? It doesn't feel like a cadence, right? It has a sense of arrival, so you can kind of let it maybe simmer a little bit. But then we go, we keep it moving until here. And that's really where it arrives, right? chord that's pretty nice right it feels very open because you have the fifth the perfect fifth at the top there right it's kind of fluffy right so that's on the third scale degree which is interesting so can we try one more time and think about where the dissonances are and how those lines kind of just flow <laughs> to stress it too much, right? The interesting stuff in this passage is... Right? Yes. So, I already heard a lot of thinking going on about the harmony. Here's the thing. It doesn't have to lead you to the same musical solution every time. As long as you know that this is where the dissonance is, and this is what's happening harmonically, you can make a different musical choice in a different moment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because in a sense, you know enough about the piece to make an informed improvisational choice. Yes. So now, can you go from the beginning and see if you can play it maybe in a different way while still thinking about the harmony? unsafe oh. unstable because you had to make you had to make those calls in the moment right yes. rather than you hadn't decided before right yes yes but um it's nice to be to be free to, uh, also yes right yeah. it's always a give and take for sure and there is um i think in in a very organic music making there is always an element of risk, for sure, because 
you are trying something that happens that speaks to you in that very moment and the um the um potential for greatness is really amazing but also potential for crashing and burning is equally amazing right so you have to you have to have a lot of courage to take risk and what I, I don't want it to sound like oh improvisers just make it up as they go because that's not really true right improvisers really truly know at every moment what is the harmony that they're playing and what is the scale that is fitting within the harmony that they're playing and so if you were interested in kind of pursuing this approach a little bit what i would encourage you to do is to really do very thorough analysis of what exactly is happening right at this very moment um, and it gets really tricky at the end right because you have a lot of accidentals yes right and so those accidentals really are clues they tell you what key it is that you're playing right so for example if you start at measure measure 10 <laughs> The reason why we have all those C sharps there is that we're going toward, we want to have a sense of arrival. The downbeat of 10 is the C sharp, and then we arrive on the D again, right? That's the original key. But where are we at the end of this section, this first section? What key are we in? In bar 10? Um, when, when at the end of the section in bar 16, what? Uh, it's uh, A major. Right. So we have actually modulated to the dominant key. Now, from our studies, from music theory and history, we know this is, this is what happens, right? We modulate to the dominant, but it's the major dominant, right, of the D minor. And because it's a minor piece, the way, w way we get there is a little bit different, right? Because we actually have D sharps in here. That's pretty weird because our key is actually the D. So why do we have a D sharp in the penultimate bar, in the second to last bar, right? What is that D sharp? Uh, it's a tricky question. Uh, it's the, the seventh. To E? Yeah, which is E is to A what? Uh, the dominant. Right, so it's a secondary dominant. And so the D actually, D sharp is really, really important here because this points us out to the secondary dominant, right? So here we have this. Sorry. That's still in D minor. And then we go. such an incredible note right so I really want to I mean it's a surprising note because you could be going we'd just be in D minor right the whole time yes. there's a lot of composers who would have just done that but instead Bach goes and then the next next thing he goes that D sharp is just amazing, right? So I want to hear more. I want to hear something special. It doesn't mean that you have to go for it super loud, right? But you could. You could also go down to it. You know, there are so many solutions to how to make it special. But you And you have to kind of decide for yourself, what is it that I want to do today? But something has to happen on that D sharp because it's such a special note. So, do you think, could we go maybe from 11? Is that an okay? From there?
What do you think? Uh, I think I was uh, getting past past that that note. You, do you like the way do you like the way that note sounded that time? I did too. Yeah. I really did too. Uh, what happens? What's what happens in that last bar? This one. What is that? That is the dominant. Yeah, that's the A. Yeah, so harmonically, that's. But could we end the? I think I I asked the question in a bad way. Could we end the piece on the downbeat? <laughs> Why not? Because uh, uh, the scale, I think it's ending. You need to have the harmony, right? So you have to have... You need to know what that... What that chord is. Yeah, but you, you know, you, it, it is also just... Um, kind of an outline of it, right? And I really like the way you're playing a shorter stroke in this one, because always when we have leaps and not so much stepwise motion, it's nice to play shorter notes, right? Yeah, I, that's really nice. Uh, so we have this contrast between, we have this contrast between a slur on the stepwise motion, right? And then we have leaps and short notes, right? So I'm going to ask you one more challenge. Go from once more from 11, that part, and see if you can think about where we have stepwise motion and stepwise scales and where we have leaps and how your performance might be informed just by those little intervallic ideas. Um, that's something that I've talked to some of my colleagues who play a lot of Baroque music, that there really is a difference and in the way the Baroque instrument and the Baroque bow was constructed, there's a difference in how it might behave, right? When you have separate strokes versus slurs and also how your notes might be a little bit shorter when you have leaps. And that actually, like if you... That's if that's your starting point, then that's actually a kind of a. Uh, there's a lot of information there for Bach. Um, could we have? Should we, Alejandro? I'm not sure when we need to change to the next performer. Um, all right, Camila. Thank you so much. You sound beautiful. So these were just my thoughts about Bach because you know this is a journey, right? And so you probably in any given moment, you're going to come to different solutions, right? And always when you're studying with a teacher, their solution should be what, what you study the most at that moment, right? But it doesn't mean that they will always be your solutions, right? And so you want to, it's something that you probably want to read about and study for the rest of your life, just like every other cellist in the world, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are you studying other things than Bach? Is there something else that you might... I mean, I, I don't mind going for more Bach. I'm, I'm always in, interested, but... I have... Uh, I have studied until Puha. Okay. Do you want to play some of the prelude? Is that, I know, I'm putting you on the spot here. <laughs> so you just imagine, um, 
And uh, do you have an image for the beginning of the prelude? Like, are you thinking of any any particular picture in your head when you play? Uh, not, not, no. <laughs> no, not particular color. No. Okay. I, I, you know, I'm just gonna preface this by saying that I have a terrible wolf on my F. You know, here on this note. Mm. And of course, this piece starts with the. With the wolf, and so I, d I don't want to play in my open, right? I don't want to have that sound to start with. I want to have this little bit of a darker sound, right? So I've, I've decided that I'm going to embrace my wolf, and so I'm going to color everything a little bit for myself when I play this. Everything is going to be a little bit darker and hazier and a little bit more foggy in some ways, right? So I have this image in my head of being in the woods in the in the morning when there's, you know, there's a lot of fog coming out. So you can't, can't quite see everything very clearly, right? Mm -hmm. today but if you think of this improvisational idea about how there is this triad then you go to the, the again in the second beginning of the second measure C sharp yes it's the same right yes. um, and then we go to the E diminished chord. Mm, interesting. And then we go back to the, the D, right? So there is like a harmonic journey that we take already in the very first four bars. That's a really interesting one, right? There's a lot of dissonance there and then there's a lot of resolution there. And we have that, you know, dissonance to consonance. Yes? Yes. Do you want to, are you okay playing the whole prelude or do you just want to work in little bits? Um, no, it's, it's okay. All right. So we have a performance of the prelude. Thank you so much, Komila. Okay. Way to, way to um, rise to the occasion.
beautiful job. I loved the drama of measure 48 of that chord where we then <laughs> stop, right? That was wonderfully done. You, the way you led up to it was beautiful. Um, each time as those scales climbed up, you got more and more intense until we kind of paused on this very, 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 um, in this very important moment. And the way you held the silence, you know, in, on the silences, we kind of become actors, right? We have to embody the drama of what happened right before. And then we have to also, uh, kind of transform the music to what comes after on the silence. So the silence really becomes a really important part of the music. And you did it really, really well. That was excellent. Uh, I'm going to talk ab about two main things here, okay? One is um, that this one, this edition, is the Baron Rider edition that you're playing from. This one is actually fairly different in terms of the bowings to the Anna, Anna Magdalena man manuscript. I don't know if you've ever seen the facsimile of that, but it's interesting because um, just like the prelude to the first suite, um, you know, the, the, the most commonly done bowing for this is the, where the bowings are very flowy and give, creates this kind of almost, it, it, it gives it a very, very, very long line. But actually, for Anna Magdalena's bowings, it, every measure it has a different bowing. And they are all like, you know, every every measure has some little slur, but it's mostly uh, it's mostly separate. And the same is true for this D minor prelude. Is that the Anna Magdalena's bowings are different, and they're not as flowy as what you have played. Uh, I'm not going, obviously, not going to change anything about your playing. I'm just putting it out there that it might be an interesting comparison. And this happened to me very much later in life when I started to actually reconfigure everything that I had learned for myself and actually analyzing what's in, in the manuscript. So there are moments where a whole measure goes without any, any slur. So the whole measure is separate, not slurred, right? And then so in the same way as in the Quran you played these kind of things separate where you had a pedal tone here in the prelude they could be also separate <laughs> you can take a look and see what you think, right? Um, that's my first thought. And with that goes, we go back to that improvisation idea. And this is a question that, if, you know, tens of thousands of cellists have pondered and wondered about. What are the chords at the end? There's five measures of just chords. <laughs> so different than anything else in any of the other suites. I mean, there's one other suite where this happens at the end, but what, what are those? Why, why? I mean, we've had this whole piece that's completely linear. And then all of a sudden at the end, we have these massive chords and cello can't really sustain those chords for a whole measure anyway. Right? If you were to count, you know, we can't really count four measures and make it work very easily, right? What do you make of those? What uh, sorry. Have you questioned have you questioned at all 
what's supposed to happen there in those last five bars? Um, uh, I see videos of uh, Chelis doing uh, improvising a lot, uh, but I don't know if that's that's what uh, Bach uh, mean. Yeah. I don't think anyone really knows, right? I think that that the best guess is to make an informed choice by what we know about improvisation and improvisers at that time of Bach, right? And I think that that's why the current wisdom, and of course this has changed, very, very different from when Casals played this, for example, right? Um, the current wisdom is that those chords indeed are meant to have some improvisation on them. Um, and I, I think in, I think that you could think, oh, improvisation is scary. It's too, there's too, you know, too much openness, right? But actually, if you if you analyze the chords, and if you know what scale goes with each chord, and then you could say, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like just make play 16 notes all the way through, right? Or, although you could if you felt it, you could also just do a few things like you don't have to it, it doesn't have to be a lot of improvisation it could be just a little bit of improvisation right <laughs> write something for yourself to play if it seems like playing complete improvisation is is too scary right so what is that I guess this is comes back to my question what chord do you have in that fifth to last bar you have this written <laughs> Yep, it's another one of those dominant seven chords. So it's an A major seven. So the scale that goes with that is the A mixolydian scale. So you have A, uh, sorry, no, it doesn't, A mixolydian. Can, can we play that scale together? A, B, C sharp, D, E, F, G, A, right? Yes. Okay, so... seems really scary right yes <laughs> right okay so um let's try this just play the triad or the or the uh, arpeggio so so let's play a c sharp with a little scale you know 
you could fill in any one of those intervals, those thirds, with a little scale pattern. Right? Or you could play up and down the triad, so you could... So there, once you know the kind of the framework of those notes, it doesn't... It, don't be critical, right? It does not have to be brilliant, ever. It just has to be something, right? And once you've done something long enough, then you can come up with something that you love. And that's the most important thing because you're the one who's playing, right? So you have to love it. Something, I often play stuff that I don't love. And then I have to go back and find out what it is that I don't love about it and what are the things that I do love, right? So can you do play this same arpeggio for me, but play a group of three going up and then double back. So you always have three notes ascending, and then you go back to the previous note and you play three notes ascending. Does that make sense? Hang on. So double back to the C sharp. Then go. Then you double back. You go backward, and then you go up again. valid note so if you wanted to add that D in there you could yeah. it's not part of the arpeggio but it is part of the scale that you could play here right so um, all right so think about this oh you could play something right there it doesn't matter what those notes are as long as they belong to that harmony and that scale, right? Yes. So I'm going to put you in a terrible spot now. Okay, try it. All you have to do is play a different rhythm than what's written on the page and some other notes. Okay? It and remember, don't be critical when you're playing. So you could start in that 58 measure. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> yes! See? Beautiful! Okay. Was that scary? Yes. Very scary, right? Yes. But do you see how you might be able to find out what notes might go there, right? Mm -hmm. So figuring out what the harmony is and then what scale it is. So you always want to stick with the diatonic scale. So the scale of the piece and then take the notes that belong to that harmony, right? So, uh, in this one, what is this chord? The last... So we have D, F, and A. Yeah, the second one of the chords. What harmony is that? It's... Uh... D minor. D minor, right? We go back to the tonic chord, right? Um, then what's the next one, the third to last one? We have A, E, and D. That's a really tricky one, right? Yes. Because it has a D and an E. I 
think that the D is actually suspended from the previous chord. So it's a kind of a, now they call them a sus chord. So the, so what it is is that the D actually belongs to the harmony that came before. And the harmony here is actually just an A. So the dominant harmony, but with a D in it. Yes. Right? Because that... That's really cool, right? The dissonance. You could really make something with that in your improvisation if you kind of took that and kind of lean on that dissonance on the it's a leftover note from the previous harmony and then the second to last of course is it's the dominant, dominant. dominant again right so actually these are pretty easy chords you have a dominant seven chord then you have the tonic chord then you have a dominant chord with a suspension then you have the regular dominant chord and then you have go back to the tonic chord, right? So all you need to know is what to play over the dominant and then what to play over the tonic chord, right? D minor scale and this is a kind of an A. Now if this was an A mixolydian, you'd have an F sharp, but that doesn't fit in with the original key, right? So you'd play A. Now, the great part about it is that if you're just not feeling the improvisation, then you don't have to. That's the freedom in it, right? You can do you can do what suits you best right now. Does that make sense? Yes. So, um, just in the last couple of minutes, and I really commend you for your bravery for keeping going with this, because I know it's not easy. A, you're playing a piece that you weren't necessarily preparing to play, uh, and you got kind of thrown under the bus and then also you're I'm asking you to do brave things like improvisation which you know you might not have done before and that's really great but for me this is very essential for Bach because it's so grounded in harmony and we know that he was a he was a great improviser and so I think that for us to at least step into his shoes a little bit when we play his music is really important, right? Even if we choose to do it in a different way, that understanding that part is really important. So um, just for a second, let's talk about uh, intonation. Uh, what's really important, I think, is to understand how major chords and minor chords are different from the standpoint of the, our overtone series, right? Because the way the cello works is that when we're playing chords, we really want to in, be in tune with our own overtones because we can hear them because of the register of the cello, right? So when you're playing the A, you really want to hear that that A is always the same as your open A, so we get the sympathetic vibrations, right? But also, you know, that needs to have the sympathetic vibration. It's the first chord of the piece, right? But the third, where do we put the third? This is a really important, interesting question. And of course, now also it's a wolf. So, it, you know, wherever you put it, it might be howling. But do you tune it to the A? Maybe? Yes. A to your open string first. It's still a little bit flat, right? Just make sure that you're really listening carefully to the A. Right! That's beautiful. Now stay there. And then find the... adjust uh down the the f the 
I, I, I thought I saw you go up a little bit. No? Yes, I, I go and I... Uh, uh, yes, it's up. Yeah. So the, what's interesting about this to me is that we hear the darkness in the minor. You know, we hear how dark it is. But that has to be separate from intonation. Because this is a chord, so we need to hear the harmony, right? And so actually in minor harmony, the, the minor third has to always be just a smidge up from what we might think. Same is true for major harmony, the major third has to be a little bit lower if you, if you, you know. If you tune that F sharp to the A, it wants to go lower. If you tune the F to the A, it wants to go higher than where we would put it, right? So you have to listen chordally. You have to listen to the harmony for intonation. That That's just how the cello works. We have to listen to the overtones. And so this... Ah, there's the howling. You hear it? <laughs> you know, so listen to that triad really carefully. Right, so the F is now just a smidge high. So you, do you, yeah, overcorrect. Try one more time. Yeah, beautiful. All right, what about, um, what about that? chord that triad or that that chord that arpeggio in the beginning of the third measure how do you solve that um, what kind of chord is that what kind of arpeggio uh, e, e minor seven it's a, it's an E diminished, right? Because we have a B flat in there, right? Interesting. It comes out of the harmonic minor scale, right? Because it has that B flat to the C sharp. So if I had you improvise over this, I would have you improvise over the E minor. Actually, D minor. Right? That's what that comes out of. But that's actually a very symmetrical chord, right? All of those minor, minor thirds are the same. And so interesting. There we have the sympathetic vibrations from the G, right? And then you could tune this. Right? So that we hear it as a symmetrical chord that those minor thirds are all the same. Can you try that once? Find your G first to the open G. Yes, better. Now find the B flat to hold hold on to the G and find the B flat, yeah? Yes, right? And then what about the C sharp against the G? Yes, that's better, right? Do you hear how it's very dissonant? Yes. So we can really lean on it at the beginning, right? But it has to be, because it's so dissonant, our ear might not say, oh, this is this chord, if it's out of tune. So it has to be very, very well 
anything that's chromatic has to actually be better in tune because our ear doesn't imply as much as it does for tone for very consonant chords right so can you go from the beginning and just play um play to just to complete include this because we're almost out of time um, if you could just play from the beginning and just think about the chords that are always in the beginning of each bar and think about um, how they sound and how dissonant they are. So if you go from beginning to the first cadence, which I think is in bar eight, right? Yes. Yes. This sounds beautiful. Are you hearing your sympathetic vibrations? It's, yes, I mean, it's great. Keep it going. Go from eight, and when you come to a cadence, you can stop. <laughs> from the whole audience. I know you might not be able to hear all of them, but I, you know, they are clapping with me. And thank you so much, Camila. I wish you the best. Uh, thank you. And thank you for being here today. And thank you for being a good sport. <laughs> thank you very much. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess that would be it from me today. I've really enjoyed working with Camila and I hope that um, you have enjoyed some of my ideas about Bach, very specific to improvisation and to listening to chords and harmonies and letting your musical choices be guided by them. So thank you for having me, Alejandra, um, and I hope to see you soon. <laughs>